Hi everybody, welcome back to Geezer Rider. In this video, we'll be talking about Bluetooth and a helmet. Um, normally, or not normally, in the old days, you'd be talking about either video or phone connection or be making distinguish, um, distinguishing between which options did both. Now, modern Bluetooth options are such that almost all of them do stereo Bluetooth and uh, phone. So rather than go real in depth into like the A2DP protocol for stereo and stuff like that, we're going to go on the assumption that whatever you're looking at pretty much net new, you know, anything produced within the past two or three years anyway, um, has all those features and, and most of that functionality. There's some more specific items that we'll, we'll get to, uh, in a moment, but they aren't going to be, um, make or break, you know, type things. So there's two ways to go with Bluetooth and uh, as far as helmet is concerned, and a third that I'll get to at the end. Um, first is integrated. So what do I mean by integrated? That means a helmet where it comes from the manufacturer with Bluetooth already in. The speakers are already inside the helmet, placed um, in a pocket inside the helmet. So it's recessed, it's not up against your ears, it doesn't pose any safety hazards in the event of a crash. And the mic, either boom mic or a fixed mic, is already in the helmet. And the Bluetooth controls and battery and charging are already installed in the helmet. So what are, what are the main concerns when thinking about a Bluetooth helmet. Um, one is, do you need it? And what do you need it for? And are you ready for it? Um, and I'll qualify those. So first of all, are you ready for it? Are you a rider who has pretty good environmental awareness? You know, you've got pretty good peripheral vision. You've got good muscle, muscle memory for all the controls on your bike and all the things that you're already doing to the extent that you can add a few more items onto your laundry list of things that you have to check and do every time you start the bike or get off the bike and, and while you're operating the bike. And while that doesn't sound so daunting, the last thing you wanna be doing is trying to mentally uh, fix some kind of connectivity issue while you're riding down the road. You'd be surprised how many uh, feet roll underneath your tires while you're thinking about something in depth like that and your concentration has been off the riding experience and that can create the potential for some interesting riding uh, to say the least so you know be honest with yourself about your um, familiarity with your current bike and your skill sets and whether you can add basically what amounts to another distraction uh, to your riding either receiving an incoming call or um, listening to music. And just think about if you drive a car as well, you know, or, or a truck or whatever, something else, you know, just think about the overhead on your, your, um, your driving, adding, playing with the stereo, you know, changing stations or whatever, even if you have steering wheel controls, um, you know, an incoming call, oh, who's this? What's this gonna be about? Okay, how do I respond to this person? Is this a work call? Do I have to respond professionally? Is it a personal call? Uh, family call, whatever, you know, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you're on a bike and you're processing all that, it's a, a lot going on in your cranium, taking away um, precious brain cycles from the riding experience. So be honest with yourself, uh, again, about your abilities and about, you know, your muscle memory and your familiarity with your bike before you go adding something additional onto it like Bluetooth. So we ta started talking about um, integrated so it comes from the manufacturer and there are a lot of options out there now um, seems like more every day almost every manufacturer you know has something in their line that includes integrated bluetooth uh, or the ability to add it and we'll get to that in a moment so the um, first item that i want to address is speaker quality because poor speaker quality, poor sound quality, a tinny sound, or where you're straining, trying to figure out what the, even the song is that's playing, let alone maybe the caller that's calling, you know, trying to make out a voice, is a distraction. So high quality speakers, you know, integrated into the helmet are actually gonna be to your benefit because 
you are not going to be distracted by poor sound quality, um, making your mind stray, trying to figure out, you know, what, what song is this really playing? And again, you know, did I hear that person correctly if it's a phone call? Um, the other flip side of that, and this is obviously only a concern for um, voice activated controls uh, or a phone call is microphone quality and microphone placement. Um, microphone quality is really tough. There's a lot of wind noise in a helmet. There's clothing moving around, you know, if it's winter time and you've got a high collar on, depending on where the speaker, or I'm sorry, the microphone is placed. If it's a boom mic, for example, having a collar rub against the boom for the boom mic can create some, um, sound. Um, if they integrated the, uh, mic into the face shield somewhere, and they don't have a proper windscreen on it, wind noise can make it almost impossible for anybody to hear you. Um, and a boom mic, which is basically a mic on a little stick, flexible stick or inflexible stick, preformed stick, which is referred to as a boom, uh, is placed somewhere in the helmet and gets in the general vicinity of your mouth. And you want that relatively close so you don't have to speak up too much because shouting is distracting and it's um not usually sustainable you know if you if you, i don't expect you to be talking for a long time on the phone on your bike but if you do and you have to shout to be heard that can get um tiresome pretty quickly so um speaker quality first order business microphone placement if you have voice activated controls or you're going to be making calls is another item then the next is um battery life because if this thing's constantly cutting out on you after a couple few hours that's an annoyance you're going to be trying to troubleshoot why is this thing not working did i lose bluetooth connectivity between the helmet and my bike the helmet and my phone the helmet and my GPS if you're using external GPS um, versus concentrating on the riding. So that's why I put battery life as number three. And remember, even for a full day, you know, if it says eight hour battery life, you're like, well, I'm out on the road longer than eight hours. Well, if you're out on the road longer than eight hours, chances are part of that is going to be fuel stops, breaks, maybe a breakfast, lunch, or a dinner. So in reality, what you really need is with a shutdown and startup, if you turn it off when you're stopped, um, you know, eight hours is probably going to equate to that 10 hour ride is what I'm getting at. Uh, another thing that doesn't come up too often, and this will be true for both um, integrated and add on Bluetooth is how do they perform in temperature extremes? Um, if it's really cold out, that can shorten battery life. If it's really hot out, the device could get overheated and not work. I haven't seen that really listed as a problem um, in, you know, with more modern offerings. It used to be an issue in the past, but it's worth, if you're interested in a particular model, you know, specifically looking to see if anybody says they have a problem with that. Or once the um, control surfaces, wherever you manipulate the controls for the Bluetooth on the helmet, if they feel soft and, and more pliable or have a, like a rubber cap over a, a rotary switch or something that could pop off when it gets real warm, for example, um, or, you know, if it gets real cold, if it could um, slip or the switches don't work as well uh, during extremely cold weather, you know, whatever's um, appropriate for your riding. You know, you could, people say, well, you know, how cold is it going to be when I'm riding with the Bluetooth? Well, maybe you're going to use this thing on your snowmobile, right? Or something on a snow machine, depending on where you live. So all things to keep in mind. Um, so let's move on to an actual helmet. This was my first foray into um, Bluetooth. It's Cycle Gear House brand. I think it was called Built. And uh, it served two things. It was my, do I really need Bluetooth or not? I was riding a bike that very, very old school, you know, drum bait, chain drive, um, carbureted, you know, on and on and on old school. Didn't have any electronics or anything on it. And I didn't want to plug anything and tax the little charging system. It just really wasn't up for much more than charging a battery and running the headlight. Uh, it also, I wanted to look into modular. And there's a reason why it being modular is poignant. And I talked about the microphone placement a little bit ago. So um, 
A helmet with Bluetooth integrated should not be a compromise as far as the features of the helmet itself are concerned. And what do I mean by that? Um, you shouldn't sacrifice safety because they put part of the cost into the Bluetooth for the helmet. So you've got, you know, a lower crash rating or something like that. Uh, I would say that you need, you know, crash protection. If you're wearing a helmet, you're generally re wearing it for good reason. Some people wear it just to satisfy the laws of their local state or municipality or wherever they're riding. And other people ride it for cra uh, wear it for crash protection. In the case of the latter, you know, you don't want to get um, a $500 helmet where $300 worth of the cost is into the Bluetooth. And that's an extreme example, but you get the idea. Um, but it doesn't have to keep you from trying it out. And this helmet is, I was trying to think the other day how old it is. I think it's like eight to 10 years old. So it's basically at the end of what should be its life, just based on years for you know decay of the, uh, the foam and everything internal. You're, you're supposed to swap them out from time to time. But uh, being modular, it does have the mic integrated into the um, chin guard here, offset, probably about three inches away from the mouth, so it's over here. I can tell you from personal experience with the chin guard locked down that you can barely be understood on the other end. And obviously, with it flipped all the way up, nobody can hear a damn thing you're saying unless you're at a complete stop with the bike turned off and even then it's hard to hear so the design of this the fixed placement of the mic is such that it really isn't in that optimal position um, for you to be heard but that doesn't keep you from listening to the radio um, i talked about speaker quality and speaker placement <clears throat> so it came with the speakers already installed and they're tucked away behind the foam and everything nicely. They don't really protrude, uh, stick against your ear or anything like that. So um, there's no real safety concern by placement of the speakers. However, they are tinny um, and therefore there's not a lot of volume. So at higher speeds, you have to crank the volume up to hear it at all. And then it's tinny. So you know, what's so bad about that? You know, it was just, it was just a cheap helmet. I mean, really cheap, <laughs> right around the hundred dollar mark on some kind of super special introductory sale. And, um, so the, the question becomes, um, why did, I'm sorry, I told you earlier it was in the chin guard. The microphone is actually placed there, which is even further away from the mouth than I said. Um, but you get the idea really, you want this to be in this part of the orbit around the uh, hemisphere of your face, you know, as close to your, your mouth as you can versus, you know, basically over here is where this thing sits. So you're, you're cranking up the volume because it's, it's loud and tinny. And that means that you're drowning out a lot of other ambient noise that you might need to hear. What's the other ambient noise you might need to hear? You know, sometimes you sense, you think you sense a car, before you even see it in your peripheral vision. Sometimes you sense uh, wind pressure differences. Um, you know, if you know about NASCAR and drafting or anything about aerodynamics, sometimes you can sense when the vehicle is near you, but a lot of times you're hearing it and you don't even realize you're hearing it. And that's what's making you alert. So if you've got uh, something very loud in your ears, you can't hear anything else and as far as ambient noise is concerned, that can be a safety concern. Uh, another safety concern is placement of the controls. So this was pretty simplistic. Um, you just press and hold a button to turn it on. There's a little LED confirmation and after a little bit, and there's a tone that plays inside the helmet. You push and hold or do a couple of multi-button pushes to sync it with your phone for either um, audio or um, phone calls. And there's a bunch of other things you can do. The features vary between um, helmet to helmet and system to system. What I would say is you want to make sure that the control surfaces are, are large enough and easy enough to manipulate so you can do that with gloves on, either summer riding gloves or winter riding gloves. Uh, you don't, if you find one that is um, capacitive response, like a touch screen, like your phone, you may need special tipped fingertips on your gloves in order to operate the device. I don't think I've encountered that so far, but if you, um, 
if you are looking through the features of a system, make sure that if it has that listed, that you have something that will um, respond. So, you know, either, either the gloves with the fingertips already built into it. So where this is placed, I found this generally fairly easy to uh, operate. Um, after a while, it becomes muscle memory. You know where each of the switches is. You know what it does. Um, one thing that I did note with this system was the reception plane, which is where the phone has to be placed in relation on your person or on the bike in order for this to pick it up, was really finicky. I could have my phone in a um, breast pocket on a jacket and it would actually lose connectivity and I would move it to my, my right hip pocket and it would connect fine, even though it was physically closer in my, um, my chest pocket. And this was true even over the, um, upgrading a couple of different phones. So I don't necessarily blame the phone, but the combination of the particular phones I was using and this helmet. So, um, that is something to look at when you are, um, looking into one of these systems is, you know, if anyone has encountered a, a issue like that and how far away you can be from the source um, and still get reception. If you're pumping gas and you get off the bike and, you know, you walk inside uh, a convenience store to pay or, you know, picks, pick up a pack of gum or whatever the case may be, is it important to you that you still maintain connectivity um, or bike to bike communication? So we talked about phone audio we talked about um, the music audio from a phone or another source or maybe um, turn by turn instructions from a gps and possibly activating voice controls the other thing is helmet to helmet communications and that's another feature that is very very common in almost all the new systems so i'm not going to get too far into it and talk about mesh systems and stuff like that you have to determine after your own research what it is you think you need out of it but i have found that um with the exception of real old systems like this one, I can generally pair a non name brand um, helmet system. And, and again, I, I talk about the, uh, the uh, Cycle Gear House brand like built um, to, to name brand like Senna or Cardo or something like that. So what's another consideration is bad replacement. Now in this helmet, it's old enough that the battery actually isn't contained in the area where the controls are. The battery is contained all the way back here in a little compartment behind the, you know, just above the nape of your neck. And there is a um, plug, like a three millimeter uh, plug that you have to put in to charge it. So that means if you lose that particular charger, you're hosed on the road because you're very, very unlikely to find it. What you want is like, you know, micro USB or USB-C connector. So the charger that you take to charge something else you may already own can charge your helmet as well. If you have an iPhone, you have a lightning charger, chances are lightning charger isn't going to work on your helmet. But if you have an Android, um, chances are you have an adapter anyway to get your, your, um, Android charger or charger cable to work with the helmet. So this was the charger that came with it. And obviously it's a, it's a fixed wired wall ward. It doesn't even have a USB cable on the end. And this is the connector that I was talking about on the end. And it is a fussy fitment to get it back here. I'm just waiting for the day for it to break because it, you have to try and angle it in and guide it in. And there was, there were a lot of critiques about this helmet about getting the, um, charger connected and one of what i didn't find though was the batteries um removable it's drop in like an old-fashioned pager or cell phone or something like that um where you can you can just drop it in so theoretically you could have bought an external charger and swapped them in and out while you rode but the battery never went bad obviously i just fired it up um and i charged it like five days ago for this video and um, it, again, it's like 10 years old, the battery still works. So I don't think um, battery lifespan is too big a deal, but you might want to look into that, especially if you find, you know, a helmet on uh, new old stock or something like that, you know, or on clearance, you might want to look and, and see about battery longevity. So that is most of what I want to say about an integrated helmet. We talked about safety. You shouldn't, placement of controls 
shouldn't dictate that you're going to lose features like where your vents are placed or if you have a um, drop down face shield control which on this one is up here <laughs> trying to remember i haven't worn this in a while and just shouldn't be that big a compromise so this is this is the old school and though it doesn't have it on it we're going to talk about an add-on system so this is just an old three-quarter hjc that i have this one's definitely past its prime but it's you know normally a decoration that sits over my shoulder here and you can see just by looking at this that i've got a vent here where possibly an external controller and this is the general place that most aftermarket systems will place the controller is on the rider's left ear side of the helmet um, this helmet has an obstruction because the vent is here so would you be mounting it all the way forward here where it's likely to kind of be in your way maybe hang forward maybe be in your peripheral vision or back here where it would be ridiculous to try and reach and control it um, also there's nowhere to put a fixed mic where it's going to be you know almost line of sight for your mouth so it would have to be off to the side so that means probably a boom mic right a, a mic on a stick that's going to come over here and you're going to need a little windscreen on it that's always going to be sticking in front of your face putting you have to bend it out of the way put the helmet off and on and off and then um, put it back in place to use it so that's a consideration the um charging we spoke about the connectors normally what they do is they put the charging port this whole area will be raised you know probably stick out to about here this um, raised area on the side here would be thicker probably double the thick triple the thickness and the charging um adapter like i mentioned uh, usb-c for example would go in either this side or that side and for any system you're going to want to know how long it's going to take to charge it so that you have know how long you have to plan ahead before going riding to have a full charge or you know if you're coming back and you're going out again the next morning is it really going to charge overnight in the hotel room and be ready at full charge the next day or is the thing so darn old or so darn slow that you know it needs 18 hours or something crazy so um nitpicky things but things to keep in mind that you might not have thought of yet so the other thing about adding on to your own system is is the helmet made to accommodate it um, either directly or indirectly so this hjc system i don't know how well you can see in this light has a recessed area around the ears there where i could safely um, glue in velcro in or somehow fasten a speaker and have it be completely away from my ear even though my ear would protrude into this pocket um, it's not going to be pushing up against that speaker so it won't be uncomfortable it won't be distracting me and i can find ways to route the wires out of it unobtrusively and what i have seen with a lot of these and some of the big uh, aftermarket manufacturers and I'll, I'll call out you know senna and cardo or cena however you want to pronounce it is they mount the thing over here but there's a fair amount of area that dips below what i call the neckline of the helmet um, and a lot of wires that come out and go around and there's usually a little slack here and i i don't like the look of it it doesn't look that finished to me but it doesn't appear to affect functionality except that your hand until you get that muscle memory and you know exactly where everything is your hand or something else you know if you're adventure riding whatever you know twigs and stuff could grab at that so think about you know the type of riding you're going to be doing whether that's going to be obtrusive or not so why would you go with um, an aftermarket add-on system instead of an integrated one? Well, we touched on that a little bit earlier, right? One of the things we said was, hey, how much of the cost of the helmet is put into the safety and quality of the helmet versus the, the quality of the Bluetooth system? If you use an add-on system, you know exactly what kind of helmet you're getting because that's all they did was make a helmet. Um, the other thing is, is you can control all the features and functionality and get, you know, know that you're going to be able to get the same type of um, system that your buddies have. And that can be an issue for uh, helmet to helmet communications.
if you want to be using the exact same type as your buddies and um, then you always know you have a backup charger for example but let's just say it's for you um, you you want to also know that i can move this system from bike to bike some of these things are you know three four five hundred dollars for a single user system um, depending on what brand you buy and what model you buy from them and what accessories comes with it so um, that's an advantage but you also have to see from past model lines how far they back they still supply the mounting docks and the mounting dock is basically a little frame with contacts on it that the module snaps onto on the helmet so if you if you lock the um, your helmet on your bike you know exposed like a d-ring helmet lock you can pull that thing off of there so somebody doesn't just come walk up and take it and you can put it in your pocket or, or what have you and go with it and snap it back on when you get back so that little modular mounting area um, you need to know that you can buy more of those and how long from now can you buy more of those so we talked about the lifespan of the helmet let's say you're a guy that swaps out his helmet every five or six years so five or six years ago from now are you gonna be able to find that mount or are you gonna to have to buy another one? And you say, well, I'll just take the one off that I have and use it on the next helmet. But what if the thing started to fatigue and got a crack or whatever, and you didn't even notice because you left it on all the time? Um, you know, five years from now isn't the time to be scrambling trying to figure out whether you can get that mount or not. So that's a consideration as well. Um, and we talked about where the mic can go and whether that system uses a fixed mic or a boom mic and if you have a place to mount that um, you're just you're gonna have to look at the system that you're entertaining and you, the particular helmet you want to put the system into to determine um, how that's going to work for you i will tell you i've seen some mics that don't have a windscreen on them of any kind depending on um, if you have a full face helmet and there's some kind of windscreen in the intake that's acting as a filter sometimes you don't need a little windscreen windscreen is just a little piece of foam like on this mic right here covering the mic um, so if you blow it you know it's not as pronounced um, but most of them should have the little foam on there and the tinier that foam piece can be while still being effective is beneficial because it's not they're pressing against your lips or rubbing against your face or is likely to get popped off um, and be a distraction. I had one come off inside the helmet. I thought a bee was in the helmet and I didn't even realize until I came to a gas stop and took the helmet off that the little foam thing was missing from the boom mic and that's probably what was flying around inside my helmet. And um, we talked about distractions earlier. Well, there's one of them. So control placement, um, a lot of times there's again there's very little area where you can mount the controls on the helmet just think about where they're going to be and how conducive that is for um, easy access for you or being a distraction and we talked about moving it from helmet to helmet so one one that isn't made specifically to add in to just one type of helmet you know and that can be anything from the mic and the speakers or just the speakers are meant to mount inside a particular type of helmet um you I, you probably don't want to pigeonhole yourself with that and unless you're going to buy you know the same exact helmet for some strange reason is still available you know six years from now uh, you probably want to get something a little bit more universal and the cost you know the the systems uh, some of them are again are the cost of, of what you might be used to paying for a helmet so um, you're really going to need to do some some soul searching and figure out what you're looking at in a system and then what you're willing to pay and then what can i actually get for it and the last thing i wanted to touch on is um, something i have feelings about and i know people that that do this and that's earbuds or airpods um, while they're riding and I'm not talking about, you know, the the over the air thing, like with the half helmet, you know, like the Harley with the five pin in and plugging into your infotainment system where it's sitting on over your ears, you know, like a, a headset, almost like a, a telephone operator would wear. What I'm talking about is literally, you know, earbuds like the old fashioned iPod or ear pods, you know, the wireless Bluetooth 
that fit in yours and have the two white things that dangle down or any other kind of Bluetooth um, earbud that goes into your ear canal. And why do I seem to have an issue with that? It's twofold. The first is, um, the, well, and they're both really safety concerns. The, the, and it's, it's hard to dissuade people that are motivated only by price because they're like, well, look, you know, if I use a pair of earbuds, I've got a hardwired connection. I don't have to worry about connectivity or anything. I can hear everything. I can hear my um, turn by turn from, you know, Google Maps or, or whatever, or my audio or my phone. And I have those controls on that wire. Good luck operating them on with gloves on. But, um, you know, and I can't argue with the quality of the sound and everything. But the other two things are safety issues. And the first is, your ear canal is either completely plugged or partially plugged. Um, the, I use the um, iPod style uh, earbuds that go into your ear canal and they generally don't let in a lot of ambient noise, like almost none at all. So we talked about that sense of what's around you and you know not, not getting that in sensory input, that audio sensory input that really impacts your ability to hear anything else. And if you doubt me, just try it. Just you know, you know, get in a room where the only you know the television's on, for example, put those things in your ears and find out how much, you know, how muted the sound is and, and you know, if it's muffled or garbled sounding as well. And then think about when you add in riding, you got the sound of the exhaust, you got road noise, you got road noise and sounds from other vehicles around you. Um, and, and how well you're really gonna be able to hear what's around you and distinguish one sound from another. Chances are not very well. Um, the ones that sit in your ear and protrude a little bit into your ear canal, but aren't really plugging it up with that rubber uh, fitment, like the uh, AirPods are uh, close second with the same concerns, right? They're probably gonna let a little bit more ambient noise through if you hit mute on your phone, for example, let's just say you're mated to your phone and you're playing Spotify or Pandora. Um, you're probably gonna be able to hear something, uh, and by something I mean a little bit better than what you could hear with the earbud style. Uh, earbuds in your phone but in your ears <laughs> but um, still still kind of muffled and muted input and the other safety factor is in the unfortunate case of an accident so if you're wearing a helmet that isn't um, made for uh, speakers to be installed in it chances are there's a foam pad pretty much you know right up near your ear right and it's probably going to be fairly rigid foam so there's an outer layer of, of some kind of cloth then there's some lighter foam and then there's some high density foam and then behind that styrofoam and then the shell of the, the helmet itself so if you were in some kind of uh, situation where you had side impact those earbuds or airpods are going to push into your ear can realize that's a very specific scenario and sounds like a really negative take on what's supposed to be an enjoyable activity and this should be enjoyable subject matter but as i've always said we, you know we give you all the information we give you your homework and you go out and make your own decision so if you hadn't already thought of that as a potential safety factor there it is and you decide what your appetite for risk is uh, i actually have never worn earbuds or you know airpods or anything like that while riding for the two safety concerns that I mentioned, even though this poor son of a gun is just tinny as heck. You know, it just, it just made me realize that I actually did want Bluetooth. Um, so when looking at the system, look for the placement of all the controls, look for the placement of the speakers, look for the placement of the mic, uh, the quality of the connection if you need to take or make calls on your ride or if you need to issue voice commands. Um, fussing with this stuff, you know, if you buy something that's really not suited for what you're actually going to be doing can be frustrating and distract you from your riding and, and uh, cause problems for you. If you um, manage to land the right system for you, it can actually lend to your enjoyment. I find that um, a little bit of, sometimes I'll just turn everything off 
and just listen to the wind for a while. But on really long rides after a while, I either, you know, I need a map update or I'm checking weather or, you know, whatever the case may be, a little bit of music. And uh, it can actually help with fatigue in some regards, I found. And that's just my personal experience. I'm not going to tell you, go out and get a Bluetooth system, listen to music, and you can ride three more hours. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying my personal experience is, you know, I find it enjoyable. Uh, it's something I will continue to look for in future helmets, either integrated or adding it onto the system. And um, I hope you are able to take this information and get what's best for you. Uh, that's the end of the video. I hope you like it. If you do, um, please like it at the, uh, on this page. And if you want more content like this, please hit subscribe and you'll hit the bell. You get the notifications when we make new videos. Ride safe. Namaste.